Is there anything worse than false labor? It is so unfair to have painful contractions for days on end, but not make any progress. Nothing makes you feel worse than to go to the hospital thinking you're in labor, only to be told, come back when it hurts more and be sent home again. Today, we're going to go over everything you can do to turn that prodromal labor into active labor. Welcome back to Every Mama's Midwife. If you're new, my name's Jess. I'm a certified nurse midwife and infertility mom, and I'm currently 35 weeks pregnant with my second baby. I was fortunate enough to avoid false labor or prodromal labor with my first baby, but I can't tell you how many mamas, especially first-time mamas, I've seen suffer through prodromal labor in the 13 years of my career. Prodromal labor is when you are full term, so 37 weeks or more, and you're having consistent painful contractions for hours, days, sometimes even weeks, but your cervix is not changing. As always, if you think you're in labor, please check in with your prenatal care provider. In my experience, a lot of women will have prodromal labor if their baby is not quite in the right position for birth yet. We call this an asynclitic presentation, meaning that the baby's head is kind of cockeyed in the pelvis and not engaged in a way where it's easy for them to move down. Ideally, you want your baby to engage in your pelvis with the back of their head towards your pubic bone, their chin tucked or flexed, and we call this the occipit anterior presentation, meaning that the back of your baby's head or occipit is towards your anterior or the front of your pelvis. This is something that your provider may be able to feel just by feeling your belly or by checking your cervix. Sometimes we can also tell that this is happening based off of your contraction pattern. If you're alternating between painful contractions and mild contractions, or if you have what's called a coupling pattern where you have two contractions close together and a longer break followed by two contractions close together again. So what is going to get your baby into the ideal position for labor? Upright and forward leaning positions. Positions that I routinely suggest to my patients are sitting on a birth ball, leaning forward, swaying with your partner, or spending time on your hands and knees. I frequently tell mamas that if your kitchen floor needs to be scrubbed, now is the time to do it. Curb walking can also be helpful. This is where you walk down the street with one foot on the street and one foot up on the curb to create asymmetry in your pelvis. I also recommend going up and down the stairs sideways to create that asymmetry in your pelvis and encourage your baby's head to rotate. As we discussed in the early labor video, I'll link it here in case you missed it, sometimes sex can be helpful during prodromal labor to help encourage more contractions. Oxytocin is not only the love hormone, it also is the hormone that's responsible for contractions. Having your membranes swept or stripped can also encourage more contractions. To have this done, you need to be at least one centimeter dilated. Your provider can check your cervix and sweep around on the inside of your cervix between your cervix and the baby's head and membranes or bag of waters. This is more likely to work the closer you are to your due date and the more effaced or thinned out that your cervix is, which your provider can tell you from a cervical exam. It is uncomfortable to have done, and worst case scenario, you may have more cramping and spotting, but not go into labor. Very rarely, you can accidentally break someone's water doing this, but I find that's actually pretty difficult to do, so if your water does break, it was likely going to break soon. Acupuncture is another good option for helping labor start. I cannot even pretend to understand how it works. Honestly, it's like magic to me. If you don't already have an acupuncturist, your provider may be able to recommend one to you. There's an acupuncturist down the street from my office that I routinely send my patients to because I know that like 75% of the time, he can usually get them into labor. I saw him when I went past my due date with my daughter and the combination of the acupuncture treatment, a membrane sweep from my midwife, and a Costco run was ultimately what sent me into labor. And I know you're probably thinking, Costco run? I do find that if you have something you really want to finish before the baby comes, maybe there's something you still need to put together in the nursery, or you have a big project for work you want to finish before maternity leave, or you just want to do that big Costco run so you know you're stocked for everything postpartum. Sometimes just the act of completing that thing and then having the feeling of, and now I'm ready for baby to come, can help encourage your body to go into labor. You'll notice I didn't put eat pineapple, eat spicy foods, or take castor oil on my list. Pineapple and spicy foods are both old wives' tales. Unless you're going to eat enough spicy food to give yourself severe diarrhea, it's probably not going to do anything. I covered why pineapple is a myth in a previous video. I'll link it here in case you missed it. 
The reason that I don't recommend castor oil to my patients is because it is associated with poor outcomes. Specifically, babies that are born to mamas who take castor oil are more likely to have low APGAR scores, and that's how we judge how well your baby is breathing after birth and how well they're transitioning to life outside of the womb. There are a lot of home birth midwives that routinely use castor oil just because that's the best tool they have in their toolkit, but typically they are making the concoctions for their patients and then watching them very closely. I still personally don't feel comfortable going that route, but every provider is going to have a different comfort level with this. I will never forget the first mama I ever saw take castor oil. This was back when I was a labor and delivery nurse, and it wasn't under anyone's supervision. Her mom had just told her to take it. She came into triage looking like a deer in the headlights with just pure liquid, explosive diarrhea, and her baby was in distress. She ended up needing an emergency C-section, and then her baby had to spend time in the NICU after birth. Not worth it if you ask me. I also don't recommend pumping to encourage contractions for the same reason. Again, I saw a mom do this to encourage labor after her water had broken, and she was at the hospital, so we had her baby on the monitor, and her baby went into distress really quickly. She needed an emergency C-section, and it just makes me really nervous. If you're planning a hospital birth, induction may be an option for you if you're at least 39 weeks pregnant and you're having those persistent painful contractions. I've definitely admitted patients for pain management because they've tried all of the things and their labor is just not progressing. If your plan was to get an epidural, you may be able to ask for one and then be induced once you're comfortable, meaning that your provider would either need to give you Pitocin through an IV to make your contractions more consistent or break your water to encourage your labor to progress. Just keep in mind that if you choose this option and your baby's head is not in the ideal position for birth, it's going to be more difficult to get it into the ideal position once you have an epidural or once your water is broken, so you may be more likely to end up with a C-section. If you are considering this option, make sure you go through all of the risks and benefits with your provider first. If you've tried all of these things to encourage labor and it's just not happening and you just want to get some sleep, then make sure you subscribe and turn on the notification bell because that video is coming next. I hope you found this video helpful. Please give it a thumbs up if you did. Thank you so much for watching.